Thank you guys for watching online. We're really excited to be with you guys today because we have a word that I know is going to encourage you and inspire you and change your life. You're going to walk away from this place changed. I just know it, right? Look at somebody next to you and say, we're going to leave different, all right? It's going to get crazy in here. <laughs> we're going to be different. I told you last week that we were going to end our series, but we just got, look at, we got to look in at the text and a little bit further into that passage, and we saw some really good stuff that we just had to share with you before we brought this series to a conclusion. So we're going to extend it one more week, and today we're going to give you guys a fifth part and a bonus message to this series, Unload, and it's going to be really, really good. Think of all the hostility that he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. Now remember, Paul was writing, we think it was Paul, he was writing to a group of people that were slipping. They were slipping in their walk with God. How many of you guys know sometimes it's easy to slip and to backtrack, to get off track? It's easy to slip. They were slipping and he's speaking to them. So clearly through this passage, verse 5 says, And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said this, My children, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you, for the Lord disciplines those he loves. How many of you guys know God loves you? And he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and you are not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we then submit even more to the discipline of the Father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in His holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it happens. Can I hear an amen? It's painful! But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest. I love this part. It's the good news. There will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those, it's conditional, who are trained in this way. Listen, none of us like discipline, but God uses discipline to get us back on track where we need to be. Discipline is a really, really good thing. My dad made me aware of this on a daily basis growing up as a child. I remember a time I was four years old, and we lived uh, in, this, in this duplex, and I had a, a, a great friend of mine. He was my only friend. He was my best friend. I know. His name was J.J., and J.J. was awesome. We were buddies. He was over at my house all the time. Sometimes I was at his house. Man, he was like family. And, and one day, J.J. came over, and I was so excited to share with him that I had just received a brand new toy plastic boat. I was just so excited, and I had to use this boat, and I had to use it fast. Well, my dad worked nights for uh, General Motors, and so during the day, he would sleep, and when he would sleep, my mom would go shopping, okay? I don't, I, can't, I don't have never been able to put two and two together as to why she would always leave when he fell asleep. I think there's probably some sort of, like, uh, state-mandated, you know, some sort of law that she broke there, leaving me unattended with a man that is asleep and cranky, okay? So... Nonetheless, she left me alone. So I invite JJ over to kind of liven up the party. I've got the boat. My dad's asleep downstairs. And I say, JJ, let's try this boat out. Let's see if the boat will float. So we go to the bathroom. And I begin filling up the sink of water. And I put the plug 
there in the drain to let the water rise. Now, for those of you guys who may not know, um, I, I, I love personal development. I love time management. And in this moment, even at the age of four, I was exercising great personal skills, great leadership development skills. I wanted to exercise my use of time management. So I thought, JJ, let's go do something else while the water is filling inside the sink, right? So with my influence as a leader, he followed me to go do something else. We went to my room, right? And we started playing, but here's the trick. You can, you can engage in all of the personal development leadership strategies you want, but if you have attention deficit disorder and you get distracted the way I do, you find that oftentimes you never really return to the original thing that you began. So it like it cancels the whole thing out. So nonetheless, I totally forgot about the sink being filled up with water until the grumpy bear from downstairs came up and said, Bradley, JJ, and he had water on his head because I had flooded the entire upstairs and water was dripping downstairs and that's what woke up the angry bear. And so nonetheless, seconds later, I, along with my best friend JJ, found ourselves, that's right, right over the top of the couch, bent over where he proceeded to spank me. And JJ was so upset, he was so hurt, it was out of control. I felt so bad for JJ. He went home, head down, lip out, crying, because my dad had just beat him. Horrible. And I thought, well, you know, if mom wouldn't have left us alone, you know, right? Not my fault. I mean, you, you bought me the boat. It wasn't my fault. But you know what's crazy is JJ was like family. He was like my brother. He was Filipino. He was my darker brother, right? He was my darker brother. So he wasn't really family by blood, but he got treated like family that day. And that was really his initiation. He never, ever seemed like a stranger anymore. He was just part of the family from that day forward. So, finish the story. Did he ever come back to your house after yeah, he did. being spanked? He did. Because he honestly was I, loved like family. Because I, I played a mean Jimmy Swaggart in the day, and I would lead him to the Lord every day over an ice cream. <laughs> On, I'm not lying. This is a true story. On the front steps of our porch, we'd get ice cream, and I would preach like I was Jimmy Swaggart. And, and he would sit on the porch, and, and he was such a good friend, he would receive Christ every day. That's awesome. Just, just, to, <laughs> just to build me up. It was awesome. This is great. Good guy. Started at the so, end of four. So nonetheless, uh, God disciplines those whom he loves. And I want to tell you this morning, he loves you tremendously. This is going to be a good word. It's going to encourage you. Bow your heads with me if you would, please. Father, we just pray right now in Jesus' name that you would speak to us through your word, your written word, Father God, that we would leave this place different than the way we came, never to be the same. Again, let us embrace it. Let us be not just hearers of the word only, but doers as well. We thank you in advance, Father God, for changing us and helping us to become more like Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. You know, for many of us, discipline has those memories kind of like Brad just remembered from the age of four it wasn't the it wasn't like you remember with joy of all the times in your life you got disciplined because oftentimes we think of the word discipline as a negative thing most of us when we think about discipline we don't think celebration we think punishment but I want to tell you today that the word discipline actually does not have the definition behind it you might think because punishment means that you want someone to suffer for what they have done. So I'm going to help you parents really quickly with a little lesson here. Don't tell your kids you're going to punish them because punishment literally means you want them to suffer. If you do want them to suffer, you might need some counseling, okay? Because discipline on you're the other hand. You're going to suffer for what you've done. <laughs> discipline on the wow. other hand means that you are trying to bring correction in order right. to make someone better. Okay, so there's a very big difference between the word discipline and the word punishment. And what we are seeing from the Word of God today is that God will bring discipline into our life if we begin to get off track. We've been talking for four weeks about the fact that God has laid out a plan. He's laid out a track for each of our life, a course that we are to all run. And God has, at the end of it, it's our destiny. And our destiny is to end up in the presence of Almighty God in heaven for all eternity. 
But the choice is ours as to whether or not we choose this track or whether we choose to go down a side road. We talked about the Bible saying that the way of destruction is the broad way. The narrow path is what leads to everlasting life, and that's where our destiny is. That's where heaven and all eternity lies. So as we begin to head down this path in our life, and you have to understand that if you're heading down that path, it means you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You've made that commitment to live for Him, okay? So now you're headed down this path, this race of life. And as you are, you begin to have people on either side who begin to call out and begin to remind you of fun things you might have done in your past. Hey, don't you remember when we did this? It was awesome. Come back over here. You're an idiot. There's only like five people running on that narrow road. Come over here where everybody's at because the crowd is on the Broadway. The crowd is on that Broadway. Well, as you're running that race and you begin to veer off just a little bit, you begin to hear the voices and you decide, you know what? Yeah, I think I'm just going to take this path over here. The Bible says that God will discipline his sons and his daughters just like we as parents will discipline our kids. Now, let me ask you, if you see a child who is out of control and the parent is allowing it, what do you think? I think you don't care that much. I think Mama Medea. (laughs) You think Mama Mama Medea cared? She cared. She cared. She loved everybody. You know, there was a, there was a, a mama here not too long ago, and I didn't actually see the clip, but I heard about it, about a mama whose son was headed out into the middle of a protest in Baltimore. And this boy is a teenager. And this mama How loved him. you guys him. saw this clip that she's clip? talking about? Okay, it's all over Facebook. <laughs> that is awesome. You know, this mama, here's the deal. Her son was about to step off into the really wrong track. He was following what? The crowd. the crowd. He was going with everybody else is doing. What's the big deal? Let's go and protest. Shouldn't have done but that. there was one mean mama who mm. said, my son is not, not going to be a part of that. And she went into the middle of that crowd and began to mm. beat the tar mm. out mm. of her son. But listen, she wasn't doing it to punish him. If she, she hated was him. doing it, if she hated him, she wouldn't She'd have left been him there. there. Exactly. Because she got publicity all over the news. Why? Because of a mama who loved her son enough to discipline even in the living fire out of him in front of all of the public. And let me ask you, if that would have been you, would you have been excited in that moment? Would you have? My my. my, Were you uh, stumped for a second? You were supposed to. Well, I'm thinking that that I would have been a little worked up. It would have been exciting. You would have been humiliated. I would have been humiliated. Yes. But it would have been exciting as I was dodging the slaps and the punches and just kind of trying to... You would be humiliated, but here's the, here's the underline to that. That mom didn't care. She knew she was about to humiliate her child. She didn't care because she cared about the long term. Right. She cared about the fact that she was going to save her son from doing something stupid, from possibly being put in jail. She was protecting her child all because she loved her son. As God begins to watch our lives, if we begin to veer off even just a little bit, God loves us so much that his word says that he does what? He brings discipline. I want to go back and just point this out to you. It says this, my child, don't make light of God's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. Do you know why Paul was telling them this? We believe Paul is the author of Hebrews. Nobody knows for sure, but based on his writings, we believe it's Paul. He was telling them because they were getting discouraged because this was a group of people who kept going down the wrong path. So they would try really hard and they would run really straight for a while and then they'd veer off because somebody was distracting them and they got their eyes off of Jesus. And as they did, God was bringing discipline. And you say, well, how is God doing that? Well, the Bible tells us that God brings discipline through one, his word. So one, you may be reading the word of God and he begins to convict your spirit. The Holy Spirit begins to bring conviction, and you yourself begin to realize, I'm not lining up. Man, when I read the Bible and it says, don't grumble and complain, and I read that, the Holy Spirit convicts me, and I say, man, i got to straighten up. I can't be grumbling and complaining. I can't do that. But if we have stopped taking in the Word of God on a daily basis, then guess what? That means we're ignoring His Word. Have you ever had a kid ignore your Word? You know, I've got four, and... I won't point them all out to you, but I've got some kids in my family that words, that's it. That's all you need. You just need to look at them and say, listen to me, young lady. 
That narrowed it down to two. You listen to me. You're going to straighten up right now. Blah, 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 whatever it is. And, I mean, you can bring tears. That's it. There's no need for any physical punishment. There's no consequences beyond that. She straightens up. Then you've got some other ones of the other gender. And they come into you, and you're, like, bringing down the house, and all of a sudden the eyes glaze over. And they almost half shut. I start rolling. And they start rolling around. And you realize, like, I'm talking, and nobody on the other side is listening to me. And if you're a mom who's ever faced that, you have at that moment this this, I don't even know what you would call it, but something rises up over you and you want for the first time in your to life call the to call the police department and say, your child I just strangled a child off. to Exactly. Death. It's like you want to just pinch uh, it right here. Yeah. Okay. That's, that was very we don't, real. But it, it does. It can hurt. And you're just like, <laughs> look at me when I'm talking to you. Listen to me when I'm talking to you, young man. Oh, I just gave it away. Young man, listen to me. Open those eyes. Well, you know what? If they continue with that glassiness, which is what we're doing when we shut the word of God and we're like, I'm not taking it in. I'm not listening. Then you know what God begins to do because he loves us? He begins to inflict some consequences into our situation. Yesterday, we had a couple of young men in our home who happened to be ours, so we loved them enough to inflict some consequences. And we had asked them to go into their rooms and to clean out under the bed and in the closet. And they took that as transfer items from yes. one place from under their bed to their to closet. To the closet, shut the door. And shut the door. Um, shove as much as you can in drawers and shove them nearly breaking dressers. Yeah. And so we come yeah. in ready to put the foot down. The it's foot is down. Done. You are going to get this room in order. Right. We pay the mortgage. Right. You get to live here for free. Right. You want a room in this house? You want to eat our food? Get it cleaned up. Clean right? it up. Well, it just is a few moments, and all of a sudden, we start hearing bickering and fighting and, like, things slamming That's into walls. That's a no-go. No-go. Right. So back we go again into this room, and it's like, you two men outside now. That's right. They're men. They're 12 and 13. They're like monkeys. And so out they go, kind of goofy-like, mm. outside with that look on and mm. the glazed-over eyes, like, mm. I don't care what you say, even mm. though you buy my clothes, pay my bills. Have, you know, it's like I'd already taken the cell phones. What else do you do? Right. Outside consequences. No. And so outside they go, and Brad's like, that's it. Both of you into the kennels. We raise shepherds. And so he's like, all of you into the kennels. You're going to go clean out the water tubs. You're going to scrub them until they are spotless. You're going to refill them, and you're going to do it together. Yes. You're going to learn how to play as a team. You live yes. in the same room. You're going to work together. Want to feel so the synergy. These boys happening. get out there. And as they begin to, you know, just, they can't even do a simple task like dump the water together without, stop it, get off me, quit, stupid, you know, they're just fighting, wow, that's kind of how it happens. Well, you were real with me, squeeze my face. Yeah, so out they go, and all of a sudden it's like, no, this is not teaching them the point, this isn't working, it's got to be worse consequences. So Brad goes out and he's like, you two, get over here now. I like here that they deep voice you because I, I do sound like that. I'm going to hurt my throat. He's like, yeah. get over here. If you can't get those things out together, because your voice is more like hurt. this, isn't it? <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so he's like, if you can't clean those out together, then you're both going to hold hands and you're going to run all the way to the lake. Now, we live on top of a hill, and the lake is at the bottom. So it's a bit of a jog and an uphill. It's, it's a beast hill. It's, it's a beast it's, hill. Just to walk, you'd yeah. be out of breath. So they continue, and they're arguing, and they're fighting. And so Brad says, that's it. Let's go to the lake. That's right. And they, they look at him and like, okay, this is not something unusual. They've had to run to the lake multiple times in their life. And so they get head off and he's like, no, hold each other's hands. Yeah. And now they're like, whoa, That's we're right. like 12 and 13. We're men. We're not holding hands. He's like, hold each other's hands and run to the lake. Touch the water and then run back up to the top of the hill and touch the driveway. So they're looking at each other and he says, and don't argue when you're doing it. Right. Okay, well. That's not going to happen. So he begins. This is freaky. Like, this is this is freaky. Here we go. So they grab each other's okay. hands, and they head off, but they keep fighting. So he's like, that's it. Run two. That's it. Run then three. Then they start mouthing. Run three. And then I was like, just shut your mouths and do what you were asked Where to do. At? I don't know. Are They're they not in, in here. They're interns. They're I want to know if they somewhere. finished. If so, they finished those three laps. Right, because at that point, the discipline had taken so long that we had things to do. Killing me. So we had to leave as they were running down the hill. We're not sure if they ever finished. I don't even know if they ever came home. Did they come home? Were they there last night? I don't know. Did we feed them dinner? I don't know. know. But, you know, God will bring the hammer down in our lives just like that. Right. He will look at you and he'll say, you know what? I'm going to give you my word. 
If you'll listen to me and you'll start bringing yourself back into alignment, that's all that needs to happen. If you choose to not listen to me, you choose to not read your word, you choose to continue to get off, there's going to be consequences that you're not going to like oh, in the moment. That's huge. It's going to be that's frustration. Huge. God's going to bring some frustration into your life. I don't want to tell you, there was a guy in the Old Testament named David. You guys ever heard of David? Yes. He's known as King David. He was Shepherd David. He played a harp. David was an incredible man. in that day man. was very manly. I know a harp doesn't sound very intimidating. He was a man of war. He played a harp. He was the, he was the man. That's true. It seems like it wouldn't go together, but it was. Trust me. Very, very masculine instrument, folks. The harp. Yes. <laughs> I don't know how to play one, so we're not going to try. But David was an incredible guy. And most of the time, we think about David as the guy who slew Goliath. He right. stepped out in faith. He was an incredible man. He was a king. He guided the Israelites. But there's a story in the Bible that I want to draw your attention to in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to tell you, in this chapter, David is king. He's king above everybody. Take that down for just one second because you're giving it away. <laughs> That's the next passage. King David, I'm going to tell you the story before I tell you the end. King David is on the throne, and every year there was a season when everybody went out to war. Now, thank God we don't live in that day and time because I don't want to do that. But all the kings would go out to war. In the very beginning of chapter 11, it says, In the spring of the year, when all the kings went out to war, David, King David, did not go. Now, would you consider that getting off track from where he should have been? Yes. He was supposed to have gone to war with everyone else. Well, while everyone else is out to war, King David goes out on top of his roof, and as he's out there just enjoying God's creation, he looks over and he sees a woman taking a bath on top of her roof. Now, I don't have time to go into it, but in Israel, that's how it was. Brad and I have been there. The roofs are flat. That's what they would have done. Well, King David, it wasn't enough that he saw that, okay? He could have walked back in the house and said, oh, no, you know, I'm not going to think about this, whatever. But instead, he calls for that woman to come to his palace. And in that, he commits adultery with this woman, Bathsheba. And when after that, he sends her home. And once she goes home, he gets a telegraph saying, I am going to have a baby. Now, at this moment, David is realizing Holy cow, what have I done? I have been off on the total wrong track. Now what am I going to do? He calls for her husband to come back from war. And he says, go home and be with your wife. Well, why do you think that was? Because he was trying to cover up what he had done. And this man, Uriah, said, no way. No way am I going home to my wife when all the men are out in battle. Absolutely not. He slept on the king's steps. And so two days go by and King David said, okay, that's fine. He said, go back out to battle, but take this note. And he takes this note and he scribbles down a note and he tells the commander of the army, send your right to the front of the line. And he sends this note with him. And he takes the note that literally commands his own death and he hands it over to the general. And he reads it and he said, if in battle he's not taken out, just in the first little bit, all the troops are to back up. Literally leaving one man out there David ordered the death of this woman's husband. So now David is not only an adulterer, but he's also a murderer on top of it. And he thought to himself, I'm going to clean up the mess that I've made. Because so often when we start going down the wrong path, we start making some poor choices. Then we start trying to clean up the mess we've made. Rather than just falling on our That's face good. before God and just saying, God, forgive me, man, I've been stupid. Get me back on track. Well, God loved David so much, just like he does you and I, that God said, okay, this is it. I've got to bring some correction to David's life. And so in chapter 12, God brings this guy named Nathan to David. And Nathan comes in and he begins to tell this story to the king. And he comes in and he says, hey, there was a rich man who had tons and tons and tons of land and sheep and goats and everything you can imagine. And then there's a poor man and all he has is one little lamb. And this lamb eats at the table with the family. This little lamb sleeps in their home. They love this little lamb. But one day the rich man went to the poor man's house for dinner and he required that the poor man slaughter that little lamb. And David immediately got mad and he said, absolutely, that is not going to happen. He said, bring me that man. He is going to be killed. And then Nathan proceeded to tell him, that man is you. It's interesting how God will get our attention. David immediately his face drops and he realizes 
I was the rich man who had everything. Uriah was the man who had nothing but a little lamb. And I not only took his wife, but I took his life. I want to read you what David did in response to God's discipline. He said this. In verse 13, Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, Yes, but the Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for this sin. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord, by doing this, your child will die. You see, the story, although it's sad, what I want you to understand is that David is known as one of the most incredible men in the entire history of the world. The Bible he's says known, that he was a man after God's own heart. He's, he's the only man in all of the entire word of God that gained that title and that privilege. Exactly. He's the only person God ever said that about. And the reason God said that is not because David was perfect, because obviously I just told you a really nasty story. And there's more. There's other stories about David where he got off track. But the amazing thing about David is when God pointed out, you have messed up, you've gotten off track, David responds with a humble spirit that says, I repent. I really did it. And he says, God, forgive me. But the difference here is that we have to understand that even once we have repented of our sins, there's consequences for our poor choices. And David, in this instance, his child with Bathsheba died because of David's sin. But what we have to understand, and you guys, you may think to yourself, like, man, this is, like, depressing. <laughs> think about your own kids. If you're a parent, you discipline your kids every single day day. It's just what you do. And I sometimes grow weary in that. And you sometimes want to just like say, do whatever you want. Like I'll do all the chores. I'll do everything because it's not worth trying to follow you around and make sure you do what I told you to do. But then I stop and think, no, wait a second. God gave me these kids as a gift into my life. I am to mold and to shape them into young men and young women who will honor God with their life. And I refuse to back down as a parent, I will stand up and do my job. God feels the same way about us. And what he does in our life is this. He looks at us and he begins to say, you know what? You have two choices. When you've gotten off track and God begins to bring his discipline, you can either have a heart that is pliable, like putty in the hands of God, and you say, God, please forgive me. I want you to mold and shape me into the image of your son. I want to be everything you ever called me and created me to be. But then there's some people that, unlike putty, they're like this rock. And they have a hard heart. And even though God begins to bring discipline into their life, they won't have it. They are stubborn. They won't ask God to forgive them. They won't change their ways. They won't allow God to move in their life. And because of it, they end up completely and utterly going off the track, completely into a life of sin. And the Bible says that if we continue to live that way, that one day heaven won't be our home, but eternity in hell will be where we end up. And you know, it breaks God's heart because as a child of God, he brings discipline into our life because he loves us. There's five things that I want you guys to know about discipline. The purpose, number one, is to keep us from destruction. He loves you enough that he wants to keep you from being destroyed. Think about this. When you look at the series that we've been in, we've been talking about running this race that God has set before us, and it's so easy to get off track, but he loves you enough that he's willing to do whatever he needs to do to get your attention. Aren't you glad for that? You remember the story of, of Jonah and the whale. God did what he had to do to get his attention. And, and the good news about this is if God is trying to get your attention, it means that you are a child of God. If you're not being disciplined, then I would have something greatly to be concerned with because the biggest fear that we should have in life is that God is not disciplining us. We should fear the discipline of God, but we should fear even more the fact that God would not be disciplining us because it means that we're not a son or a daughter of God. It means that our salvation has not been made secure. So if he loves you, he's going to wreck your life up a little bit so he can get your attention. How many of you guys have found that to be true? You start slipping away from God. You, you, you have discontinued your track of putting Christ first. And it just seems like everything is starting to fall apart. It's because 
God loves you. Everybody's always asking for a sign. Everybody wants to see a miracle. Don't you think it's amazing? That it, it just so happens that when you begin to get your focus off of Jesus, everything seems to fall apart. Do you not see that that's a miracle of God? Where he is active and engaged and alive and well in your life. That he loves you enough that he is getting you off track so you can get on track. The track that you're on isn't working and he loves you enough. He's keeping you from destruction. The second thing is, is discipline is the means. Uh, the means is, is his word that he brings to us and the action that he brings before us to bring change. The motive is to express his love towards us. The goal is to teach us obedience. Do you guys know that we are blessed when we obey? How many of you guys want to be blessed? Raise your hand. Yes. We're blessed when we obey the word of God. And we are disciplined when we disobey the Word of God. He makes it so very simple to understand. It may not be simple to do, but it's simple to understand. You want your life to be blessed? You want the favor of God? Be obedient to God. If you want the discipline of God, then be disobedient to God. And watch His love be poured out on your life. Watch Him. The next thing is the result of discipline is short-term pain and long term gain. Think about it. When he loves you enough to, to, to exercise his discipline in your life, he pushes you towards the high prize and that high calling that we all look forward to, and that's heaven as our home. How often do you guys think about the significance of eternity? I know that it's easy to get up in the mornings, and you get ready, and you go to work, and you feed the kids, and you do this, and you do that, and you get caught up in your day. But how many times do you think about the fact that we're not going to be here forever? But the Bible says life is but a vapor. We're here and then we're gone. We're not going to be here forever. We're not going to be on this earth forever. You're not going to be working that job forever. Somebody say amen. 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 You're not going to live in the house that you're living in now forever. The Bible says that even now he is preparing a place for you to live. Even now, he has a name prepared for you in heaven in the Lamb's book of life. You will walk on streets of gold. You will see family members that have gone before you that had a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus that was contagious. They're there, and they're waiting, and this is temporary. And God's world, heaven, is eternal. And that's what drives me. That's what motivates me. And that's why he pushes so hard to get us back on track. And he uses discipline to do it because he wants us as his children to inherit heaven forever and ever and ever. Listen to Proverbs 13, 24. It says, he who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him chastens him promptly or disciplines him promptly. I want to, in closing, tell you one story. And that is all throughout the Bible, and you've saw, probably seen pictures of Jesus as the good shepherd. And you wonder to yourself, why, why is Jesus in a picture with all the sheep? What's that all about? Well, all throughout the Word of God, it describes Jesus as a good shepherd because in that day and time, raising sheep was just what people did. And if you go to Israel, there's still people today that are doing that. And so they, they understood what a shepherd was and what the job of a shepherd was. And so all throughout the Word of God, you see these illustrations laid out about the shepherd. And this one is no different. And this is talking about discipline, but it says, He who spares the rod. Well, a rod, a shepherd had two tools. One was a, a staff and one was a rod. This is a staff, okay? I don't have a rod with me today, but a rod would have just not had this crook piece. So it would have just been straight. So I'm going to turn it upside down. We're going to pretend like this is a rod, okay? If a sheep that was in your fold would not stay with the entire pack but kept wandering off and doing its own thing, the shepherd would bring that little sheep over to him and he would take the rod and he would bash it against that sheep's leg. And you say, wow, why would he do that? Well, the reason he would do that is because he wanted that sheep to understand that it was not to run off. He would then take that little sheep with its broken leg. Will you hold that for a sec? And he would put it up on a table or maybe on the ground and he would take the leg and he would tape it all back together, make it straight, wrap it up. Then he would put that little lamb on his shoulders. And for the next six weeks or however long it took for that little lamb's leg to grow back perfectly, he would carry the lamb on his shoulders. And you've seen pictures. If you haven't, Google it. You can see pictures of Jesus 
with this lamb on his shoulders. Well, during that time, imagine the lamb is right next to the shepherd's face. Don't you think that that little lamb got very comfortable being right next to its shepherd? Beginning to understand, I don't ever want to run away again. Because even though that shepherd inflicted pain and he brought discipline, that sheep learned to never, ever, ever go astray. And it began to fall in love with its shepherd. And within the, that time of six weeks of being so close, when that little lamb's leg would have been mended, he would have taken off those bandages, and that lamb, and this is a known fact in history, that lamb would walk right next to that shepherd to the rest of its life. It wanted to be, bam, right here, probably almost annoying. You know what I mean? Like one of those kids that are hanging on their mama. Right here. Because why? Because he learned what it was like to be with the shepherd. He realized that, you know what? The shepherd loves me. He wasn't trying to let me get eaten by wolves and bears and anything else that I would have wandered out into the wilderness and come up on. He loved me that much. And don't you know that if that, that shepherd loved that sheep enough to do that, how hard was it? to take that rod and break its leg. That shepherd probably had a broken heart having to do that. And that is where we stand before God. Jesus is the good shepherd. And he says, man, I laid down my life for you. I know. He, see, he's there sitting next to the Father right now. And he's looking around at heaven. And he's like, I know what you have to look forward to. I know I'm already here. If you'll just stay on the straight and narrow, if you'll just run the race that my Father laid out for you, you can do it. You have so much to look forward to. Stop looking off. Stop getting distracted by all the things of the world because sin is only fun for a season. And then there comes a day where we will stand before God and discipline will come. We can either be disciplined now and like David, humble ourselves and say, God, forgive me. Bring me back on track. Or one day we'll stand before God and the discipline in that moment, rather than hearing, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter in to eternity in heaven. Rather, our discipline will be, depart from me, I never knew you, you doer of iniquity. Our heart today is to help people understand that today we can choose to humble ourselves before Almighty God. Today we can choose. None of us are perfect. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to veer off track at times. But God wants to bring us back into alignment. And it's our choice. I had a brother. Um and much older than me, and he was a, a tremendous, tremendous athlete, uh, amazing, amazing football player. He was playing for a university, and he was being scouted uh, by the Chiefs and um, doing very, very well, but he had, he had a problem. He loved to party. He loved to drink, and he, he drank himself out of school. He was about one quarter from graduating with a business degree an amazing football player, and he just ended up falling apart. He, he moved away. He ended up having a child. He, he really lost sight of the dream that he had, and alcohol just really gripped his life and became a major part of his life to where he became just a severe alcoholic, and he couldn't function without it. He became homeless. He went to prison. He had a really, really rough path ahead of him, and I could see continually how God was trying to get his attention, bringing his discipline. He, he, he came so close to dying so many times. He was in some really, really bad car wrecks because he would drive drunk all the time. And he got into a really, really bad car wreck in, in, in one time, and he just smashed right into a tree. It wasn't even his vehicle. Smashed into, into a tree, and he almost died. And we thought that would be enough to get his attention, but he was so stubborn that he just wouldn't get it. He was so strong-willed and so bullheaded, he just wouldn't get it. But finally, finally God softened his heart enough. Once he, once he got to prison, uh, he opened his eyes, and he began to search for the peace that surpasses all understanding. And I had the opportunity uh, to, to hear the words from my brother tell me that he had received Christ in prison which was so amazing. And he had had such a rough go of it, just such a roller coaster journey. Um, you know, I was really looking forward to watching my, my brother be able to live out this new life of faith. And, and uh, it, it didn't quite go like that. It wasn't long after he got out of prison. He was really trying to live for God, but at the same time, he was struggling really, really hard to stay saved, if you know what I mean. And in this 
case, God executed his discipline, his love on him by taking his life. He had a massive heart attack while he was in his living room floor. And we found him three days later, face down. And the Lord just took him. He just literally took him. And I've oftentimes asked God, you know, Lord, did, did you maybe do that on purpose because you knew that long term he was going to struggle so hard to stay saved and to really live for you that you just, while he had a relationship with you, you just took him like that. I don't know. I don't know if that's what God did or not. I, I often wonder that. But I do see how God extends his love to us by executing his discipline. And my desire for you life, for your life is, is that you wouldn't get to that point to where God has to take your life so that he can secure your relationship with him in heaven forever. But that you would live your life in repentance and that you would accept that you would accept his 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 discipline and his correction and that you would learn from it and turn away from the way you have been and that you would embrace the direction that he's giving you to get back in the race to get back on track to strip off those things that are slowing you down tripping you up and to never ever 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 quit don't quit don't give up the race that God has for you and the finish line that he has before you is worth fighting for. It's worth the sacrifice. It's worth the battle. It's worth enduring the discipline, the love of God for you to get back to where you need to be. Remember, if he calls you, he qualifies you. And he has called you to finish the race. He's called you to be a finisher. You might say, Pastor Brad, I'm a failure. I have tripped and fallen so many times along this race that I've been in, this race of life. I've fallen. And again, I'll tell you, get back up. Just as fast as you fell down, get back up and keep on running. King David fell. He fell over and over, and yet God still called him a man after his own heart. And he still gave him a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. And he is the same God, the same God of David is, is your God today. And he is ready and willing to forgive you of your sins. No matter what you've done, no matter who you've done it with, no matter where you've been, no matter the thoughts you've had, the things you've said, it does not matter. He is the God of second chances to infinity. And he loves you this morning. And I want to pray for you today. If you would stand up with me. I know we've gone a little over. But I know this word has, has been for somebody today. I know that God is wanting to really minister to your heart today. My challenge for you right now would, would just be this. If, if you are experiencing the discipline of God in your life, embrace it. Love it. Enjoy it. And know that it's because He loves you. If you are not experiencing the discipline of God, then maybe you are far from God. Maybe you don't have that real and life-changing relationship with Him. But I want to pray that you would. I want to pray that we would embrace the love of God in our lives. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I pray over each individual in this house and those that are joining us online today. Father, I just, I thank you. And we probably don't thank you enough for the discipline that you bring to our lives. God, you, you discipline those whom you love. You bring discipline to those who are disobedient. Because you love us. And you're saving us from hell. From destruction from eternal punishment. You love us that much. Father, I pray for those that experience this discipline that I'm talking about, God, that they would just embrace it, that they would love it, that they would just see from the perspective that, that you, are, you are engaged and involved in their life and you consider them to be children of God. And let them have a thankful heart, God, and let them just turn away from those mistakes and run the race that you've set before them, Father. And God, for those in this place or online that, 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 
don't experience the discipline of God because they're not children of God, I pray that they would receive Christ right now. I pray that they would admit in their hearts that they have fallen down over and over and over and over and that they would ask you for forgiveness. I pray, God, that they would believe upon their heart that Jesus is the finish line and he's the only way to finish this race. I pray that they would confess him as Lord of their lives. I pray that they would discipline themselves, dedicate from this moment forward that they're going to run this race according to your word, that they're not going to be hearers of the word only, but doers of the word that they would commit to be in your house every time the doors are open and surround themselves, God, with people of the faith that will build them up and encourage them and inspire them and lead them deeper into a relationship with you. Help them to make that decision today. We thank you, Father, in the precious name of Jesus. Everybody said, amen. If you love God's discipline, put your hands together. Give him praise today. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. If you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself, give to our ministry. We've made giving easy here at Mountain Movers Church. If you have your smartphone, just text the number 918-223-8090. Just push in the amount you want to give and push send. It's that easy. If you don't have your smartphone, not a problem. You can mail your giving just as easy to 24,000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. Thanks for watching today. Hey, remember, we're dreaming big for you. We'll see you next week.